Pastor Joe, I speak to him about every two weeks. That's the negotiated term with my wife. Every two weeks, you must speak with Pastor Joe, okay? And it's like when the diesel in my Jeep starts going down, she can tell. Go talk oh, to Pastor tell. Joe. I'm like, how long right has now, it been since you talked text to Joe? Him, call him. I'm going to make a shirt. If you don't, what was the shirt? If you don't no. know, ask Joe. Yeah. That's right. Coming soon. <laughs> Coming soon. So please put a huge East Coast welcome together for Pastor Joe Chambers. Those books are $20, not 10 so yeah, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. I, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about your book. So, but it's a promise I made to my mother. My mother died a little over a year ago, and she'd made me promise that before I died, I would publish a book. And so I did for her, and so that's what that is about. I am um, very honored to be here. Thank you for coming back tonight. I understand there's a football game on. I don't really care. I'm from Colorado. My team hasn't seen a playoff in, since Peyton Manning, so I don't really care. Um, and I'm also, you don't know this, but I'm a, I'm a Southern Baptist. Yeah, I just try not to act like one. And so I'm sure I, I tell you that now since you're already here. That way, you know, in case you have issues like I do with Southern Baptist. A friend of mine are, and I are going to start a podcast, and the podcast is going to be called Two Very, Very, Very Bad Baptist. There's a market for that, don't you think? And when I say that I'm a Baptist, um, the reason I say that is because Baptists know what they're going to talk about. Tonight, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to talk about. I hope that's okay. I do want to tell you a story. Because what I want to think I want to talk about is getting close to God and your identity as a follower of Christ. Sometimes the reasons we don't get close to God is because we're not sure he's deep down, we're not sure he's good. So I want to read you a piece that I wrote. I was a member of a church a few years ago and the person who did the welcome and the announcements greeted everyone every Sunday morning with this statement, God is good. And then he paused and waited for our response. And our response was always the same. All the time. And all the time, God is good. You went to the same church. <laughs> Here's the question. Do you know deep down, rock solid, dead for sure, that the God you worship every Sunday morning, the God you follow, the God you serve is a good God? Theologians throughout the centuries have talked about the intrinsic goodness of God, which means in everyday language that all the good that God does in the world, all the good he does in your life or my life flows from this basic character and nature that God is good. My youngest son, who's 31 now, but when he was a little boy, one night, I came home from work and he greeted me by saying this. He said, Dad, are you in a good mood? And I said, maybe. <laughs> Why? He said, eh, just tell me when you're in a good mood. Because I have a question. Well, my son knew at that age that it's always better to catch me in a good mood if he wants to get something from me. But his father is full of sin and is very selfish and can sometimes get very short and curt with his children. 
I love the fact that we worship a God who never gets in a bad mood when I want to talk to him. I don't ever have to say, God, are you in a good mood? Because if you are, I have something I want to ask you. But if you're not, let me know and I'll come back. God is intrinsically good. Catch him any hour of the day and you'll rest assured you'll find him good. It is his nature to be good. It's his approach to every day, every person, every situation, which is why in creation account in the book of Genesis, after God created everything that he ever created, he always ended by saying, it is good. Then Adam and Eve made terrible choices, as you know. They rebelled against God. And soon after, their children and their grandchildren fell into every evil sort of thing you could imagine from thievery, adultery, murder, rape, war. And so what does an intrinsically good God do when the creation that he made that he called good goes bad? He could have walked away from it. He could have wiped us all off the face of the earth. But on the contrary, this intrinsically good God put a good plan together to stem the flow of violence and evil in the world. And it goes like this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. That's a good God. My wife is with me tonight. She's right over here next to Matt. She's the most beautiful person in the world to me. She and I will have celebrated last December 41 years together. She's a first grade school teacher and she had to take some time off this week to come to Florida which is why yesterday being so cold was a big disappointment to us. <laughs> but come on, Florida, you came back today. It was a good day, nice and warm. When we got married 41 years ago, we got married in Slidell, Louisiana. And all of my family made the trip down to New Orleans area. My aunts, her, or her aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins and I was sitting in the living room in a chair one afternoon, the week of our wedding. And I was reading, and I noticed Lynette's grandmother, that's my wife's name, her grandmother Maskey. Grandmother Maskey is the most beautiful woman, strikingly beautiful woman in her 70s, maybe 80s at that time, I don't remember. She had a beautiful white hair, high cheekbones, a gorgeous white smile. But she had Alzheimer's. And she never, all the years that I knew her, she never called my name. And this day, she was in the kitchen where I suspect she'd spent a lot of time in her lifetime on a farm in Nebraska where her husband, my wife's grandfather, was a farmer. And while in the kitchen in this suburban home in Louisiana, I noticed her with a rag. She was wiping down the counter that did not need wiping down. And she would just have this circular motion. And she moved down the counter closer to the sink. She was just wiping it down like you know she had probably done thousands of times on the plains of Nebraska. She got to the sink area and she looked out as if she were looking through a window out into the plains of Nebraska where the wheat field, where her husband might have been. And as she was moving her hands in that circle, she stopped right there. And I can remember as a 24-year-old man looking at that and actually feeling some bitterness swell up in my heart. Because I would love to have asked that woman what my wife was like when she was a little girl. When she came to the farm, what was she like? 
What stories did you tell her? What did you ask, what did what things did you do? Did you guys sew and make dresses together? What happened on the farm? I would have loved to have asked that, but I felt a little robbed that I didn't get to have that conversation with Grandma Maskey. And there was this, I don't know, bitterness kind of coming up inside of me. I was so frustrated at the injustice of what I was seeing. Grandma Maskey was just rubbing circles on the top of that counter. But then she stopped. And she looked out an imaginary window and she started to sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. I was staggered by that song. And in that moment, God told me that my life was going to be needlessly painful and full of disappointments if I didn't let go of bitterness and simply trust this truth, God is good. The scriptures say, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I have, and he is. In the, there's a little uh, ice cream shop in Buena Vista. By the way, it's pronounced Buena Vista, not Buena Vista. <laughs> Jeez. Buena Vista is how you're supposed to pronounce it. But the locals pronounce it Buena Vista. There's a story behind it that I'll save for another time. But in the beautiful town of Buena Vista, which is about 2,700 people, by the way, there is an ice cream shop called Louis. And in the courtyard, Louis, there is a giant blackboard. And at the very top of this blackboard, against a red brick building wall, there is this statement Before I die, I want to, and then you fill in the blank. And you might have seen things like this before, but in this particular courtyard, you have line upon line upon line, and people will write anything from the profound to the profane to any number of things that you might imagine. Before I die, I want to, and then they have a piece of chalk, and they write it. One day we were in there, and down at the bottom of the right-hand corner, I saw scribbled in really small letters, Before I die, I want to be loved. Wow. Wow. That is the sad cry of the human heart, is it not? We all want to be loved, but loved by whom? Now, if I were to tell you God loves you, you would go, well, of course he does. He has to. He's God. It's a theological impossibility for him not to love me. But would it also be true for me to tell you that God not only loves you, but he likes you? He likes to hang out with you. In fact, when he looks at you, he smiles. Would it surprise you to know that the God that thought you up is so madly in love with you, there's nothing you can do about it. He loves you more than anything in the whole world. A.W. Tozer wrote this. He said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me say that again. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, in our tradition, in my tradition, we grew up with a lot of very famous sermons. There's a payday someday. That's a Baptist preacher sermon. Then there's another one that's very famous. You might have heard of this one. Sinners in the hands of what? An angry God. Well, put that on a T-shirt. When you hear that, you think of, and it's a very famous sermon by Jonathan Edwards. I think about that, and I think, what is so 
compelling about that. And we sang songs when I was growing up, songs that said, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for a worm such as I? A worm. Man. Now, I'm kind of wormy. <laughs> and the reason I'm wormy is because I do wormy things. And you are too. But if you think about it, when we start to describe ourselves that way, then when we think about God, we think that maybe this good God might be, I don't know, upset with us. I know that I'm speaking to some people in this room who feel like they probably have made God mad. I had a friend named Steve Hookstra. He passed away a few weeks ago, months ago, and uh, one time I just felt like I needed to ask him this as one of those old friends, Matt. I've known him, though, for 50-something years, and, and I, I had took him out to lunch, and I said, Steve, it feels like there's something between us. It feels like I irritate you. And he said, it's not you. Everybody irritates me. <laughs> and he's not telling the, he's telling the truth. Sometimes I think we think that about God, that we just irritate him, that he has to love us because theologically he has to. The most important truth about me is the fact that I'm a worm. Is that the most important truth about you? Is being a sinner the first and foremost truth about who we are, that we are sinners? Now, I know some of you are going to maybe resist this just a little bit because we have been taught all our lives. And in my father's church, my father's a pastor. When in my father's church, this is kind of how you're a sinner. But is that the deepest truth about me? I've grown to believe that it is not. Now, let me tell you a little bit of background to the story of Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, as you know, and then he traveled down to Egypt where he spent a few years because an angel came to Joseph in a dream and told him to go down there. And, and then when Herod died, the angel came back to Joseph and told him and the angel said it was all clear. He could go back to Nazareth. And when he went back to Nazareth, Joseph set up shop in Nazareth. How big a town do you think Nazareth is, by the way? Anybody got an idea? Well, my town is 2,700 people. Do you think it's smaller or bigger than that? It's smaller than that. Theologians will tell you or archaeologists, uh, archaeologists will tell you it's anywhere from one to 300 people. The town that Jesus grew up in had one to 300 people. Now, when you live in a town with one to 300 people, what do you know? Everything about everybody. You cannot hide the fact that Joseph and Mary had something unique happen in that first pregnancy. You know that was talked about. But this is the town that Jesus grew up in, and Joseph did what he did for a living. He was a carpenter. Now, we say carpenter. I don't know what you think of when you think of a carpenter, but I think of a master builder or at least a home builder. But how much home building is going on in a town of one to 200 people? Not an urban sprawl happening here. And so... In this town, probably what Joseph did was, yeah, he might have built you a home, but there's not a lot of trees in Israel, so there's a good chance he used stone, so he worked with his hands. There was probably a time when he would be the guy you would call to come fix the roof in your home or build a shed out back for your new goat or dig a trench so that your latrine would drain properly. In other words, Joseph was probably the town handyman. Joseph was a town handyman in a town of one to 200 people. Somewhere between age 12 and age 30, Joseph passes away and Jesus takes over the family business. Jesus is now the town handyman. He's taking care of his mother and his brothers and sisters and, and he's fixing roofs and he's making tables and he's hanging doors until he's age 30. And then at age 30, he moves from Nazareth down the Jordan River Valley, about 68 miles, where his cousin is baptizing people. Do you remember this? John the baptizer. John the southern baptizer is down there <laughs> baptizing people. It's in the southern part of Judah. Come on. 
there are, there are Southern Baptists who believe he's the one that started our church. <laughs> Crazy people, those Southern Baptists, I'm telling you. And the only reason I'm still the Southern Baptist is I'm not that far away from retirement. They got all my money right there, right? <laughs> but here's John the baptizer down there baptizing people, and Jesus comes walking up. And when John sees Jesus, he says in John's gospel, not John the baptizer's gospel, John the apostle's gospel, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. Then Jesus keeps walking towards him. He says, I want you to baptize me. And John says, no, I should not be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And they get in this back and forth. And the smartest thing John ever does is say, yes, Jesus, I'll baptize you. And then Jesus and John are in the waters of the Jordan. Oh, my gosh. And I think John is shivering, not because it's cold but because of the moment. And as he stands in that water and he lowers Jesus into the water and then raises him up out of that water, do you know what the scripture says? Matthew tells us that the heavens opened and the spirit descended in the form of a dove and lit on Christ's shoulders. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved I'm pleased with him. My gosh. There are a lot of scenes in the Bible that I want to see when I get to heaven. I want to ask God, could you just let me see that? Could you put me back in time and let me be on the shores or maybe put it on the heavenly jumbotron? I want to see this moment. Can you imagine John, scared out of his mind at the moment, Hands on Jesus, but lowering men to that murky water. And as Jesus comes up out of that water, his hair is matted down on his forehead. Rivulets of water are dripping off his beard. He's blinking back water. His robe is clinging to his chest. And a dove lights on his shoulder. And the voice says, this is my son, the beloved. I'm pleased with him. I want to see that. Dale Bruner says this, all the kindness heard in the father's voice for his only true son is conveyed to us at our baptism. I told the staff this morning, Paul's favorite word to describe the relationship that we have with God through Christ is that we are in Christ. He uses that phrase 150 times in his writings. We are in Christ because of our covenant relationship that we have with God through faith in Christ. Now, I don't know all that means, but at least some of what that means is that when Jesus went down into that baptismal waters of the Jordan, I went with him. And when he was raised up out of that water, I was raised up with him. And when the voice said, this is my son, the beloved, he was saying that as much to me as he was Jesus. Not because I've done anything, but because I'm in Christ. And so are you. What had Christ done to this point in his life to merit such a beautiful term of endearment? You're the beloved. I'm pleased with you. What had he done? He'd done nothing. He'd taken care of his mom, his brothers and sisters. He'd hung a door. He'd dug a trench. He'd fixed a roof. But he had not preached the Sermon on the Mount yet. He had not walked on water yet. He had not opened the eyes of anyone blind yet. He had not opened the ears of anyone deaf yet. He had not called Lazarus forth yet. He had not died on a cross yet. He'd done nothing that you and I know him for. And yet his father said, you're the beloved. The deepest truth about Jesus is that he's the beloved and he hadn't done anything to value it, to merit it. And because I'm in Christ and you're in Christ, the same truth is true about you. You are the beloved, and you don't have to do anything to gain that. 
Now, it's not always easy to hear the voice that would call us beloved. There are a lot of voices out there, cacophony of voices, always in our ear. The noise is loud. Jill and Mark came to Buena Vista to the place that I do some work with, and they came for a soul care intensive. And Jill told me this story and gave me permission to share it, and so I'm going to tell you this story. She was struggling with feeling as if God even knew her name, much less where she lived. She was a pastor's wife in the Durango area, and she was a mother of young children. Husband was always busy. She was always feeling like she was less than and not seen and that kind of thing and feeling small. And, and she said that one fall in Colorado, this is a big deal, you go looking at the colors change, like the aspen turned gold. And so she and her husband, Mark, went up for a, a Jeep trip. And she happened to be driving in the Jeep to go see these trees that had turned from green to beautiful gold. And she loved trees. And she was feeling small and feeling less than as they were crawling up this hill. And she was driving. And as she was feeling this, like, the smallness in her soul, she said, suddenly, her husband said, Jill, you make me smile. And she turned to her husband and said, Mark, thank you so much for saying that. You just, that's so unlike you. And he said, I was just reading a tree. There's a tree out here. And carved in the bark of a tree are the words, Jill, you make me smile. She slammed on the brakes, put the Jeep in park, ran around, and sure enough, with a heart around it, a big tree were the words, Jill, you make me smile. And she said, at that moment, it did not matter to me that my husband didn't mean them for me. It didn't matter to me that the man who drew that on the tree and defaced a tree didn't mean them for me. As far as I'm concerned, God was telling me right then and there, I see you, Jill. You make me smile. God remembers you. God chose you. God sees you. Even if no one else sees you, even if no one else knows your name, God knows your name. The deepest truth about you is that because you are in Christ, you are the beloved of God. Jesus needed to hear those words more than once. I don't know if you know this, but he did. At the very beginning of his public ministry at his baptism, he heard, you're my son, the beloved, I'm pleased with you. You fast forward a few years and towards the end of his life, in Matthew 17, he goes up on the side of a mountain and he takes Peter, James, and John with him. And while they're up there on the mountain, Matthew says that Jesus went a little bit further than, Matthew, than uh, Peter, James, and John. And a Shekinah cloud of glory surrounded the mountain. And Peter looked up and he sees Moses and Elijah there. And Matthew says they're talking to Jesus about his departure. The word in Greek is the word for exodus. Editors will tell you he, they were talking to him about his coming death. And Peter, being Peter, opens his mouth before he thinks about what he's saying. And he says, this is... In the original Greek, by the way, this is really cool that we're here. Could we build a lean-to, maybe? One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah John. You want in on this? I mean, this is, could we do this lean-to and we could all just hang out here? And I love what Matthew says. Matthew says, while Peter was still speaking, the voice came. And the voice said, this is my son, the beloved Listen to him. At the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he heard the voice say, this is my son, the beloved. At the end of his ministry, just weeks before he was to be crucified, he heard the voice say, this is my love, beloved. And I think many points in between, he made space to hear the Father say, you're the beloved. When you study the gospel of Luke, you discover this. Luke tells us 
almost every page that Jesus would engage in public ministry and then he would withdraw to a solitary place. Then you turn the page and Jesus has come and he's engaged in public ministry and the crowds get big and then he withdraws to a solitary place. It's almost as if in the Gospel of Luke, the disciples are always looking for Jesus. Where is he? When they can't find him, do you know where he is? He's up on the side of a mountain. He's out beside the lake. He's up before dawn. He's by himself. What's he doing out there? He's making space so that he could hear the Father say, you're my son. You're my beloved son. He was, he was creating an opportunity for intimacy with his heavenly Father. He needed to hear that because the voices that were coming at him were pretty profound. You're the son of the devil, they would say. No, I'm the beloved of God, he would remember. You're a drunkard and a sinner. No, I'm the beloved of God, he would remember. You are an illegitimate child. No, I'm the beloved of God, he would remember. You're a lawbreaker, they would say. No, I'm the beloved of God. If you're the son of God, get down off of that cross and save yourself. No, I'm the beloved of God, and he stayed. Christ would always be tempted to forget his father's voice. And you and I are tempted to forget it as well. Because we have, and you have, what I have, spiritual attention deficit disorder. <laughs> I can get so distracted and forget who I am. And you can forget who you are. If you've invited Christ to live inside of you, you are the beloved son and beloved daughter of God. And that's the deepest truth about you. Macrina Whitaker said this, Oh God, help me to believe the truth about myself no matter how beautiful it is. My brother's a poet. I'm not. But I wrote a poem. Before my first sin, before a single star or subatomic particle was ever spoken into being, I already existed in the mind of God. Before I was a sinner, I was a son. That's the deepest truth about me. It's deeper than my sin, my belovedness. It's the deepest truth about me because it is the first truth about me. And it's the last truth about me. And it's the truth about you. We are not worms, you and I. We are the beloved of God. The devil knows your name. that calls you by your sin. God knows your sin that calls you by your name. What comes to your mind when you think about God, I hope, is that he's good and that I'm his beloved daughter, his beloved son. Rest there. Rest We have a song that I want to have them play at this moment. You just close your eyes or you can watch the screen because there's some more lyrics there. Let's just spend a moment reflecting on the truth of your belovedness. self-loathing you own the voices inside of your head you own the shame and reproach of your failure it's time to own your belovedness you own your past and how it's defined you own everything everybody else says
smiled with 